course, he's very well known to all of us here. And he's, of course, director of the Center for Utilization Focused Evaluation in St. Paul, Minnesota. But less <coughs> well known is that he wrote a book about hiking the Grand Canyon that was a finalist for the Minnesota Book of the Year in the creative nonfiction category. He also won the University of Minnesota Storytelling Contest and volunteered in Burkina Faso in the Peace Corps in the 1960s, for those of you who think that was ancient history, Vietnam was going on during those years, doing agricultural extension. And so without taking up any more of his time, I'd like to introduce Michael Quinn Patton. Oh, good morning. It is uh, indeed a great honor to be a part of the launching of this forum and to get to spend time uh, with uh, colleagues, uh, especially with Eleanor on this occasion. Um, and what you're going to find is, I hope and think, at least my experience of it is, an almost seamless uh, segue between Tom's framing and what I'm going to do uh, is Eleanor, by the way in which she posed the issue for us in her paper of looking at balancing theory and practice in the real world. Uh, and as I reflected on that, it seemed to me uh, and that Tom's exposition of this tells us that the way in which that happens and where that happens is actually not out in the world, but it's in here. It's what goes on in the brain. And there's been a huge amount of work in the last couple of decades, the last decade in particular, about the brain, which uh, is one of the last great frontiers. We're only beginning to understand it. Almost everything that I was taught about the brain in biology turned out to be wrong at the time that I was uh, growing up. So we're still learning about it. But um, I got intrigued by trying to make sense of the very challenge that Tom laid out for us, what happens in the brain when we face those questions that he has articulated. Um, and so that's where I'm going to take you through. So the phone rings, and I see on my caller ID that it's a nonprofit that I know in town, but not one that I've worked with. And I answer and say, this is Michael Patton. And the person on the other end of the line says, are you the patent that does evaluation? And I say, well, that, that is the rumor. Uh, how can I help you? <laughs> well, we need one. OK, what kind do you need? A long silence. <laughs> kind? Yeah, you know, like if you're going out to dinner or to a restaurant, you have to go to a kind of restaurant. Or if you're buying a car, you have to buy a kind of car. Um, well, uh, what, tell me, what's your situation? Well, we got this grant from the Knight Foundation, a three-year grant, and we're coming to the end of it, and an evaluation report is due in two weeks. <laughs> and I said, I don't do that kind. <laughs> the very kind of situation that Tom laid out, mm -hmm. the real story. Michael Lacombe made this observation, which I found quite inspiring. The best doctors about expertise. The best doctors seem to have a sixth sense about disease. They feel its presence, know it to be there, perceive its gravitas before any intellectual process can define, catalog, and put it into words. Patients sense this about such a physician as well, is attentive, alert, ready, cares. No student of medicine should miss observing such an encounter. Of all the moments in medicine, this one is most filled with drama, with feeling, with history. And I would add with the integration of theory and practice in exactly the way Tom described. I've had one such experience with a physician in my life. I've had several such experiences with evaluation clients when we were completely in flow with each other. And it comes from, and in fact is a definition of what constitutes expertise. Because 
what Tom described in the way in which we integrate theory and practice in the real world is, in fact, a matter of expertise if one does it well, as opposed to simply falling back on habit uh, and uh, old rules. The people who are dealing with this to a great extent, one of the areas is people studying artificial intelligence. And we've had uh, the development of the Deep Blue program by IBM that can now beat world chess masters. And last year, the emergence of the Watson program that is expert at playing Jeopardy. But these folks are also studying great legal minds, great medical diagnosticians, great psychotherapists, great architects, great military minds, trying to figure out how they think. What makes up their expertise? And I've had the opportunity to talk with folks doing this work <clears throat> and ask them about what they're learning. And a bit counterintuitively, expertise does not consist of answers. Expertise consists of exactly what Tom talked about. Expertise consists of astute and sophisticated situation recognition. Experts know how to inquire into and understand the situation they are faced with, and the answers and the actions emerge from that understanding. And so what I want to do is go inside our brains to inquire about how that happens. What is the nature of expertise as it actually unfolds in our brains? And to invite you to inquire into your own knowledge about these things so that I propose to amend the conference theme, use it or lose it, and to add that the premise for both using or losing it is knowing it. Know it. Know what's going on in here. And know it, use it, and lose it, because a lot of what's going on in there isn't worth having. <laughs> and in fact, is getting in the way of true situation recognition and situational responsiveness. It is precisely what Tom talked about, of falling back upon habit and old rules instead of being attuned to and in the situation and comfortable with doing it. I coach a lot of evaluation newcomers. Many of you are students. I find the biggest error that novices regularly make is the need to generate a design in the first few moments of an interaction because of the tension of what am I going to come up with and begin to imposing then solutions thinking that that's the object while those of us who have been at it a long time um, get faced with the example Tom gave of, are you ever going to get to design? You know, how, how much longer are you going to be asking questions about the situation here? When are we going to get down to, to a design? Um, so let me pose the framing of this challenge. A student sophisticated situation recognition. Let me have you do a thought experiment. Imagine 20 evaluation specific situational dimensions each with five points along a continuum. Here's an example. We face a, a client organizations and we assess their um, evaluation capacity, the kind of work that Deb Brog has been a pioneer in, in evaluability assessment. Um, low capacity, high capacity, five points along the continuum. And we can generate a large number of these continuums. Uh, the evaluation resources available, low, uh, high. The, the politicalization of the situation, um, low or high, uh, on and on. If we, I, if we imagine 20 such dimensions, each of which has five points along it, the combination of those dimensions yields 3,200,000 potential situations. So when we are facing that, what do we do? to sort through it. And this is where brain science is telling us about what happens in our heads. From cognitive science, which is the study of the mind, they're coming up with an understanding of neuro units and neuro network learning algorithms that when we experience a new situation, our brain 
takes in the information from that situation and begins a massive search for where to place that information and finds these very containers and concepts that Tom was talking about and searches through those to locate the dimensions of that new situation in those containers to figure out what's going on. We cannot operate otherwise. And the quality and nature of those containers will define the situation for us. From decision science, work on decision heuristics, the ways in which decisions sort through the various parameters. We can't go through 3,200,000 possibilities. We need shortcuts. That's what heuristics are. They're the shortcuts. From contingency theory, which I grew up with in sociology and organizational sociology, which was trying to understand the different ways in which different kinds of organizations are effective under different conditions, and led Herbert Simon and others to conceive and, and propose that contrary to the economic models of the time, we aren't maximizers of goals, we're not even optimizers. The best we can do is satisfice. Satisfice is finding a satisfactory solution to move forward so that we are not bound by the hardening of our categories, so that we're not paralyzed by inaction, by the overwhelming complexity of the blooming buzz and confusion of the real world, as William James described it, but that we can take action. And it's this combination of learning algorithms, decision heuristics, bounded rationality, satisficing, contingency theory that ends up moving us into some kind of, of action. Our brain has a whole series of if-then contingencies. And if-then is fundamentally a way of thinking about what theory does. So that the ifs are a whole set of parameters for figuring out what the situation is that tells us then what to do. But we're having to deal with a whole bunch of those all at once and in combination. And so we need shortcuts and heuristics and we inevitably rely upon them and cannot do otherwise. Situations like this one that Eleanor so beautifully described, one of my favorite situational challenges from her work. Among the things that must be anticipated, attempts by those in power to hide needed data from evaluators and therefore the public. She talked this morning about the public interest. Or to suppress evaluation findings by classifying reports as top secret. So evaluators will have to learn to deal with secrecy even as it expands to grotesque levels, and even, as happened to us when she was directing GAO's Evaluation Institute, they are faced with the bizarre situation in which their report is classified so high that they, the evaluators who wrote it, are no longer allowed to read it. How do your situational heuristics help you deal with that situation? Nobody in the world got better than that, than Eleanor Chalemsky, um, at working through those. So what I propose to do is to share with you, out of my own reflective practice, the six core synthesizing concepts that I think, out of my constructed reality, guide my practice. Uh, let me preface this by noting, Eleanor and I talked as we were planning to come here about wanting to be sure that we honored the memory of Carol Weiss, who we lost in January. Carol and I involved in, were involved in some debates about evaluation use, the very theme of this conference in uh, 1989-90-91 that Marv Alkin uh, pulled together in his book on debates on evaluation. And it was one of the profound professional development experiences of my life, having those interactions with Carol um, in her good-humored and very patient way with my youthful cluelessness about the real world. Um, and she enlightened me uh, about what was going on. And I came to understand that what I thought were major differences between Carol and I were differences in our situations, that we faced different contingencies, but that in fact, the heuristics we used to make sense of those contingencies were in fact the same. 
but our situations and the, the challenges we were facing and the arenas in which we were operating were different. And that appeared to be difference in thinking when in fact it was only difference in context. Um, and that understanding uh, is a part of what brings me to where we are today. So what I'm prepared to provide you with is a learning algorithm satisfying contingency theory evaluation framework, six evaluation sensitizing concepts, or heuristic constructs illustrating an evaluation sense-making neuro network. John, a drum roll, please. Thank you. <laughs> Unveiled for the first time at the Eastern Evaluation Research Society, the, the inner brain droppings of Michael Patton. <laughs> now, despite John's elegant drum roll, I don't sense that you're really quite ready yet. So let me, um, <laughs> let me try to get you a little bit more primed for, for, for this. For the last 40 years, evaluation is all that I have done. I spend most of every day thinking about evaluation, working on evaluation. I'm a full-time evaluation consultant. It's how I make my living. I get regular feedback from the marketplace or I don't eat. Um, I do about 60 days of training evaluation evaluators every year. Uh, I do extensive writing of books and articles, make presentations. Uh, I have a group of evaluators that I coach. This is what I do. And so I took this opportunity quite seriously to reflect on how is it that I do this, what goes on inside my own head, as I've been fascinated by the developments in brain research and out of cognitive science and decision science and contingency theory. And so, are you now ready for the six sensitizing concepts? <laughs> All right. Here they are. My contingency filters. Um, the numbers are not in order of importance, but the order in which I'm going to discuss them, and I have left one minute per filter. So um, we're going to fasten your seatbelts. We're going to move through these very, very quickly. The first is users' contingencies. Eleanor has been one of our pioneers in thinking through this, identifying, understanding, engaging intended users. And she said, the concept of usefulness depends upon the perspective and values of the observer. This means that one person's usefulness may be another person's waste. And so we have to understand, as Tom illustrated with these examples, this third person, second person, and first person perspectives on use. And we have some rubrics for making sense of this, one of which is this kind of mapping of stakeholders along two dimensions, the degree of their interest and the degree of their power, um, which yields different kinds of stakeholder groupings, the involved, the players, uh, the crowd, the context setters. One of the kind of, of heuristics that we begin to make sense of, what is the, the user environment? The nature of the evaluant. Contingency theory and organizational development was based upon uh, the finding that you had to distinguish organizations from whether they were doing routine things or non-routine things and whether their environments were stable or dynamic. Well, we can apply that to the nature of the evaluant. To what extent are we dealing with some kind of high fidelity model framing of the evaluant, standardized, narrowly focused, a, a clear specific logic model, best practices oriented, high consistency of implementation, routine, predictable, rubrics based, or an innovative adaptive framing? Um, a responsive environment, broad multiple dimensions of the evaluant, systems change, adaptable principles, dynamic, non-routine, uncertain, highly customized. These are fundamentally different kinds of evaluants, and we do different <laughs> things with them. Evaluation purpose. Again, Eleanor has been one of our leading thought uh, experts on this. The purpose of evaluation conditions the use that can be expected of it. And she wrote about the difference between accountability purposes and improvement purposes and knowledge generating purposes. I have six purposes that I distinguish uh, these days and use, but the question for you is how do you make these distinctions? What are your rubrics that tell you how to make sense of what's going on? Process use distinctions, process use orientations. 
One of the dimensions around which we differentiate is the, the degree of, to which the evaluation needs to be thought of as an independent process versus an interactive or interdependent uh, process. Independent processes are external, findings focused, judgment oriented, uh, careful boundary management. Interactive evaluation processes are relational, process focused, capacity building, participatory, collaborative. These are different ways of going about the work of engaging the process. Situation and context analysis. Deb Brog, who's here, devoted an entire conference during her presidency to trying to sort out how we make sense of, of context. Um, and one of the, the ways that I find it, it most useful is, a, again, a matrix along the, uh, the horizontal dimension is the degree to which there's a knowledge base, the theoretical bodies of knowledge Tom referred to, that tell us how to attain a desired result so that if we vaccinate a child, we know they won't get polio. That's high degree of certainty. What do we do about climate change? That's an extremely low degree of certainty. And on the horizontal, on the vertical dimension, is the degree to which the stakeholder environment agrees about what to do and that knowledge base. A high degree of certainty, again, with the the world has signed on to eradicate polio. The World Health Organization, the Gates Foundation, they've already spent $6 billion on that effort. Um, climate change is highly contentious. And what this yields in, um, uh, from a complexity perspective are situations that are simple, not simplistic, but simple, in that we know what to do and there's agreement about what to do. Situations that are complicated because they have lots of moving parts and lots of different stakeholders and situations that are complex because of a high degree of uncertainty and dynamism that you're dealing with. One way of making sense of situations. And so finally we come to evaluator characteristics. And by the way we have a substantial body of research identifying these different pieces including um, the latest issue of evaluation and program planning that has just come out is devoted to uh, the presentation of evaluation theorists uh, theories via logic models to look at what they do in practice. It's a, it's a great uh, volume of that journal for those of you who are interested in, in pursuing some of these, uh, these characteristics. Evaluator characteristics. We have evaluators who define their role very narrowly. Um, as specialists, methodologically focused, technically oriented, task focused. And those of us, I include myself in, in this group, um, and Tom and Eleanor and Laura, as broad and expansive role. We are generalists. We cut across lots of different areas. We focus on critical thinking uh, as much as or more than methodology. It's, uh, interpersonally oriented and task and process um, focused. And so what I find is when I face that new situation and the heuristics that begin to operate in my mind are operating, I'm filtering through these baskets of concepts and the dimensions that underlie those. Becoming an experienced reflective practitioner of the kind that Tom ended with, understanding the basis of deep evaluative expertise, integrating theory and practice through conferences like this, through working on cases, through engaging reflective practice, means that one of the key questions about evaluator characteristics is the extent to which the evaluator is an experienced reflective practitioner, brings deep evaluation expertise, and integrates theory and practice. So let me close with some thoughts about getting good at this work. When I was in high school, I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. The only time that all 18 high schools in Dayton were brought together at the arena in the county um, fairgrounds was to hear Bob Richards speak to all of us as high school seniors. Bob Richards was the Olympic um, pole vault gold medalist twice and a decathlete in the Olympics. And he talked about what it takes to become great at something. And it was the first time I heard a rubric that has now reappeared and is widely circulated 
Um, he said, if you want to become really good at something, at anything in your life, put in 10,000 hours. Well, the people before you today put in their 10,000 hours a long time ago, 20,000 hours a long time ago. I would conservatively estimate that Tom, Eleanor, Laura, Jill, John, Deborah, Jody, others here with great experience have well over 50,000 hours apiece embedded in this kind of, of work. And the, the challenge here is that we not become habituated, that we not become routine, but that, that we stay alive to new situations. And the invitation, what I've shared with you is my understanding of my own heuristics is not prescriptive. It's not to say this is how you ought to do it. It is meant to be an invitation to examine your own heuristics. What are the containers and concepts and tools that you fall back on when faced with a new situation? How do you take in information about the situation to be able to do contingent analysis and be adapted to the, the situation? And I think that the way we do that is these things interact in a dynamic way and that we're engaged in not one kind of reasoning but three kinds of reasoning all at once. Deductive reasoning is where we draw upon theory. Inductive reasoning is where we're deeply enmeshed in the observations of the situation. And abductive reasoning is where we connect the deductive and the inductive parts to do problem solving. In abductive reasoning is the Sherlock Holmes kind of reasoning, is figuring out what do I do now in this situation. It's looking ahead to what might be and seeing can you connect the dots through a modus operandi kind of analysis, a crime scene investigation kind of analysis to make sense of how you get from there to here and how you got from there back to where you begin. And so here is my pictorial. And Stephanie, I'm embarrassed to display these graphics uh, to you, so you'll, you'll forgive me, but I offer my, my, my PowerPoints as a, a bad example because you, you need bad examples to use in your workshops, and so I offer this up. We begin with an engaged mind that is open to the situation and theory that we already have. The issue is not whether you have theory. You have theory in your heads. It's already there. Those concepts and tools and ways of thinking are there. The question is how aware you are of them, how conscious you are, how much you are controlling them, how much you're working at enhancing their use. And so those theories that are in our heads, those concepts, those heuristics, those paradigms, encounter the things that we observe. <clears throat> and we take in those observations inductively in a situation put them together between the theory and the inductive situational observation through our practice wisdom, which involves abductive critical thinking, the very kind Tom was talking about, and that leaves us with a contingent evaluative thinking expertise. That's what I think we old timers do, and that's what we invite you youngsters into this exciting world, so that we stay <laughs> alive and observing not only at the beginning of the situation, but we continue to watch as it unfolds and to pay attention and uh, test our understandings and grow and develop in the very way that Tom talked about. We do that through uh, in, in investigating cases. Laura and I have been involved for over a decade now in work on developing evaluation cases for case teaching aimed at uh, helping generate these very kinds of understandings through Harvard Business School kind of cases. All of the great professions, once you have the 101 courses, move to case teaching. Business schools, law schools, medical schools, in rounds. Uh, it becomes situation recognition, and that can only be taught by going through situation, 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 and extracting things from them. So the challenge, I think, is to match the evaluation process and design to the nature of the situation, a contingent theory-guided evaluation practice. And that's what we invite you into. Thank you. <laughs>